There's a lot of debate about the limits. What if you had a, a, a town, a city, and they had a factory and a power plant, they were using the local coal, and at that point, they were above that. Let's say they were making three pounds of SO2. Do you just go in and set your fines so high a level that they just sh shut it down? No more electricity tomorrow. Guys, the EPA law was passed. Sorry, we're turning off the power plant. I don't know what you're going to do for electricity. Maybe someone will sell it to you really expensively. Oh, and all the people working at the factory and the power plant, you're out of jobs. Bye. And I think the local politicians and the state's politicians are going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't just come in and say, boom, this is what it is. Yes, we agree it's a good idea. But clearly, you need some phase in time and you need a system. I think a good example of cooperation in government was the system they came up with. Cap and trade, emission trading. They wanted to create an economic incentive for companies to produce less sulfur dioxide than they would have otherwise and give them an economic reward for doing so. So let's say 2.4 is my limit. And I'm in some factory and we make three. But there's some other factory that says, you know, I think we can install this new scrubber system. And we can do things to try to reduce our sulfur dioxide emission. And let's say they only make 1.8 pounds. The government will issue people credits for this. This is part of the cap and trade thing, the thing called pollution credits. You could have admitted this much, so we're going to give you something of economic value because you produce less pollution. That's great. You're rewarding people for making the investment to produce less pollution. And you can turn around and sell it to these guys. And they can use your credits to get the amount they emit down to the legal limit. Some people said, oh, this is terrible. You're letting people pay their way out of polluting the world. Hmm? Remember, it's called cap and trade, right? So we're going to say this is the limit we want to achieve. But we're going to let the marketplace determine this because this plant is going to have to pay money, right, to buy those credits. And those credits will cost so many dollars per ton. This gives the economic incentive because you get money for having these credits and the other people have to pay money. And then they can say, you know, we're going to start out buying the credits. We don't want to throw everyone out of work. But in our next retrofit, let's add a uh, pre-scrubber. Let's add a, a regular scrubber. Let's add some um, fuel upgrading. Let's do a few things to produce less sulfur. It gives us an economic reason to do so. This system worked. In 1980, there was a certain level of uh, SO2 production, okay, overall in the U.S. By 2007, this number had cut in half, 50% reduction. In fact, in the intervening time, that limit was changed not 2.4, but 1.2 pounds per million BTU. So this is the limit today, and in between here, they were able to do this, and by 2007, even that half a limit was done, and by 2012, this had gone down to an 80% reduction. So the power plant scheme of saying cap and trade, and even change the cap, was a success. Environmental groups could buy up sulfur dioxide credits. 
and decide not to trade them, right? Let's just take some out of the system. By letting this be traded in the free market, it also gave an economic incentive to have this actually happen. Let's make a chart of the uh, date uh, versus the dollars per ton for one of these credits. In 2005, shortly after that lower limit was instituted, this was $1,600. Pretty pricey. By 2009, this had dropped to $88. By 2012, it was around $2. And today, here in 2015, this is 86 cents. Why so cheap? Because pretty much everyone is under the limit. And nobody needs to buy the credits. We're producing 80% less SO2 in the air as we were doing before. In 2003, a similar system was enacted for nitrous oxides. And it's also had quite a dramatic effect in the reduction of nitrogen oxides into the atmosphere. This brings up an interesting debate on whether one should adopt a similar policy for carbon dioxide. Since people are concerned, rightly so, of global warming, should we institute an economic policy that so clearly worked to reduce our SO2 burden with CO2? On the face of it, it seems like a great idea. But there are some very important differences to understand. Nobody wants to create SO2. If you could get rid of all the sulfur in the coal ahead of time, you'd do so. The problem is that CO2 is the end product of burning our fossil fuels. It's the whole reason you're doing it. You're taking those atoms and rearranging them into a more stable state. You're actually getting the energy out by making carbon and burning it with the oxygen in the air to make carbon dioxide. So, Really, the amount of CO2 you make is equal to the amount of energy you're producing. If you're capping and trading on that, you're basically saying, don't consume any more fossil fuel energy. So, this would be quite a boon to the types of energy sources that don't make carbon dioxide. Nuclear power would benefit. Most of the renewable energy systems would benefit. They represent less than 20% of the global energy use. When we look at countries like India and China, who are rapidly industrializing or beyond industrializing, going into a modern era, producing electricity and a higher standard of living for their people because they're using more energy, to say, I'm sorry, next year you can't use any more carbon-based fuels or you've got to pay this cap and trade, they're not going to sign up for that. And countries that could, like Europe or, or the US, there's already economic incentives in place that each year we're producing more goods and services, producing less CO2 in the first place. So perhaps you don't need the specific cap and trade policy. Although it's a wonderful economic model that perhaps will work. It's also much more difficult to institute. How many players were in the SO2 market? Well, unless you owned a coal power plant or a major coal producing factory, coal, coal consuming factory, you had no need to do this. The number of people that this concerned, the number of entities it concerned, was limited in the thousands. Everything, every use of fossil fuel, everybody's car, everyone's business makes CO2. How extensive does this regulation become? How huge of a bureaucracy do you need to track it? How do you make sure the rules are fair and equitable? Will you create unintended consequences by regulating something so immense? I'm not sure what the answers are to those questions, but I do want to point out that when we think of cap and trade in a limited situation where you're making a waste product, not an essential component of what you were trying to do in the first place is different than the CO2 solution. 
Not saying we don't need a CO2 solution, okay? But I'm just saying that we've got to, uh, uh, it's a more difficult question.